Welcome to Leaders Creating Ruckus, where we explore how disrupting the status quo can create long lasting opportunities. I am your host, Ashi Aurora. I'm an executive coach where I help professionals learn how to rise in leadership. I bring to my clients, as well as to my listening audience, over 20 years of leadership experience, and I'm excited to share all that I can. So if you're searching for ways to get noticed for the next promotion, wanting to launch your own business or integrate work better into your life, then tune in each week. I promise you will hear from amazing leaders who have so many pearls of wisdom to give us. And today, one of these really high wisdom leaders is here with us. We have the founder and CEO of Precipio Company, Matthew Cahill. Matthew's company partners with businesses to analyze and address how bias is impacting their bottom line. Included in the self-reflective process is the identification of hidden and sometimes not so hidden biases that impact company performance. They coach organizational leaders to reduce mental mistakes, strengthen employee relationships, and move organizations from bias to belonging. Matthew is on a mission to demystify and destigmatize cognitive biases, disrupt social biases of all types, and dismantle bias that becomes institutionalized in our respective businesses and public agencies. Now, I know that's a mouthful. There's a lot there. And I can't wait for Matthew to dissect all of it and help us understand it so much better. Matthew Cahill, welcome to our show. Mm, Thank you, Ashi. It's a pleasure to be here. I can't wait. So Matthew, for our listeners, we want to know who is Matthew Cahill? Take us from there. Oh my gosh, Matthew Cahill, uh, uh, as you said, I'm the president and principal consultant with the Precipio Company. That's my uh, day job. Um, I'm also uh, a chauffeur uh, (laughs) for my children. I have a a 13-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son. Uh, The chauffeur trips include now, you know, teaching my son how to drive, uh, which is a nerve-wracking prospect. And uh, so I think you know, being a dad is a full-time job. It is a cons- all-consuming part of who I am, uh, but it's a, uh, it's a true labor of love. Oh, I love that. I love that you started off with explaining Matthew Cahill as dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that makes for some funny uh, interactions. That w- I met my wife at this place in San Francisco called Glide Memorial. And uh, for anybody listening, like Google it, Glide is, it has a, you know, just a historic connotation because it's a radically inclusive place in one of the most radically diverse cities on the planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and, and so I met my wife there, we've raised our children there so much so that, you know, while we were there, you know, amidst the sea of, of diversity, I became uh, Matt daddy. Like that became my, really, nickname. yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a woman who was part of this congregation. I saw her at a provisors meeting, which is a business networking group that you are aware of. And from across the room, this was pre-COVID. She looks at me and she's like, "Matt, Daddy," and I'm looking around, <laughs> mortified. And people are now staring, going, "What? What is this? And what is this relationship?" So it was a, it was a classic convergence of two different. Uh, Two different contexts that, that came together in that moment. Love that. So San Francisco, tell us about some of the other roles you identify with. Oh my gosh. Um, other roles that I identify with, um, such as um, like, like demographic roles. What are you talking about? However, you would even look at like from a perspective of a term that you once taught me a long time ago, dimensions of diversity. When you think about your dimensions of diversity, where would you head? Oh, duh. It's a listening audience. They can't see how white I am, right? <laughs> I'm a white, middle-aged, cisgender, heteronormative male uh, who um, you know, often creates uh, confusion by standing and stepping into a panel that would be considered a diversity panel. Like, mm. what the 
is this guy doing uh, in that context? And so that's, uh, that's kind of a fun space to swim in. Um, what other roles? I think, uh, you know, in this, in, this, in this space, I think I've become a tremendous ally and advocate as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, important for someone like me mm -hmm. who enjoys uh, a byproduct of social structures that are geared for white men. And, uh, you know, many of my white American colleagues, uh, you know, they, they bristle at, at the changing of the landscape um, because they're losing power. And uh, they're losing power because the world is changing. It's fundamentally changing where power is becoming more and more distributed. Like it or not, it is. And that ain't going to change. And, and power is never given up, you know, willingly, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's often, you know, people cling so tightly to it, they take it to their grave in many cases. And we have uh, institutions and a history that that's that serve to like reinforce that notion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think I, I, I help people evolve and I help people adapt. That's one of the, the byproducts of my work. Tell us about your journey to this work that you do, especially the allyship and advocacy that you were saying. What are some of like some of your earlier memories of when you decided like this is important to you or, or something started triggering in you that you need to do something different. Well, I can go the earliest memory when I go through these exercises is when I was a kid. And I grew up in a little town called Garden City, Michigan. And Garden City for uh, anybody from the state of Michigan, Michigan people put up their hand and then they point to us. They make it look like a mitten because yeah. that's what the state looks like. And then they point to the spot where they grew up or where they were living or where they lived. And Garden City is a very small, kind of blue collar, very white at the time town. Like it was 98% white. Uh, and there was literally a dividing line from Garden City to another town called Inkster, Michigan, which historically was designed to house the black community. This was designed to house the white community. They were both redlined communities in those older maps of, uh, you know, real estate maps of the area. Um, but uh, Garden City, being all white, something inside of me made me think of a need to get out of that, like, whiteness. Like, I wanted to find, I, I mean, I, I pictured, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know what the, um, what the cartoon was. It was a cartoon of that time that had like different colored superheroes, right? And they all formed one collective thing and then they would go and attack and whatever. And, and I had always oh envisioned- Oh my gosh, an image is coming to my head, but I can't, I can't name it. I'm sure some of our listeners could. It's robots of some sort. Like they were like <laughs> these individual robots and they became a big one. And then they, you know, they would go off and conquer the evils of the universe. And Like Transformers? But no, that's not what you're alluding to. But yeah, anyhow- yeah, well, well, you know what? In like 10 minutes, we'll think of it. Like, oh, yeah, oh, it'll, come. it'll come to us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so, I mean, that was probably the earliest notion that I had of like this isn't there's something that's just missing, I think, when you're in a homogenous group. And especially if that homogenous group is the dominant cast in society, then mm -hmm. you don't really even know that there's other things that exist. There's other stories or other narratives. There's other ways of living. And I think that that idea fueled me over the years to get me out of that area, to get me traveling and really immersing myself in other cultures, which I think most Americans that haven't had that experience are really missing out on something that's that that can that has the potential to change you for the better. Mm -hmm. When you really can be an other in somebody else's dominant context, yeah. you can't help but be changed by that experience. Even if you're just going to, you know, a neighbor's backyard barbecue where you're the only person who identifies as you do, right? right? Like that's a small scale example of it. But to go and live in another culture where you are that, it's a game changer. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And then tell us about 
the birth of Percipio Company and, and even, even prior to that, some of your work experience and how it led you to there? Well, I mean, building off of that idea. So when I finished college, my first job out of college, I was the I was a teacher on wheels. I had a, I had a show called The World of Robotics, mm. and this is in 1992. And so I drove from Michigan to California across the United States, myself and seven robots, and we just you know cruised into these schools and we'd set up these these shows. And I taught children about robots, and I did that for nine months. I traveled around. The, I did wow. this. I had the the Southwest tour of the world of robotics. That was my, that was my first job out of college. And, uh, and even that experience just like kind of fueled my, my need to go and, and learn about different cultures because even in the, you know, in the nineties, the United States was vastly different. Right. And it, there was, yeah. there was so many, you know, the Midwest and the East coast and the West coast, they all had their own unique identities it was, it was never framed as being so, you know, polarized as what yeah. it is now. I mean, the, the polarization of America, I, I'm very dubious about the reality of it. I think it's much more perception, but then perception begets more reality. Right. I think we've always been divided. Yeah, just absolutely. Really I think there's a lot of human nature and we'll get to bias, right? Like, and some of your taglines, part of the company. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. then you know, fast forward, I, I lived in the Dominican Republic for a couple of years. I came back, I went to college, I went to graduate school a couple of times. Finally, I landed in San Francisco in the early 2000s and actually in 2000. And, uh, and that started my career mostly in the tech sector. And I started accumulating best practices that became the basis for the Percipio company. Mm, very nice. So transition us into when you launched it, why you launched it, what, what happened there? Kind of the Matthew K. Hill, the entrepreneur. You asked tough questions, Ashi. <laughs> uh, Our list, my listeners want to know who Matthew K. Hill is before they, they listen to what Matthew K. Hill is, is talking about and promoting here in terms of for everyone to understand this concept of going from bias to belonging. <laughs> well, the the origins of the Percipio company are are not very noble or by design. Uh, one of my former bosses at E Trade Financial, he was working for a small startup. He left E Trade, and he went on to he was a serial startup guy before there were serial startup people, mm -hmm. and uh, and he went to this other. Um, small startup at the time and realized they need what I had to offer. And at that point, I had just started a different job and I was very happy there. And so I didn't want to leave. And he said, well, don't worry about it. Just come in, tell them, like assess the situation. And then you could just do some consulting. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And so I went down to this small little startup called LinkedIn. Uh, this is LinkedIn really? before oh, LinkedIn wow. became publicly traded before it was yeah. acquired by Microsoft. And, uh, you know, I, I met the chief of staff. I followed, you know, I, I did what I was supposed to do. And I, uh, he said, so when can you start? I said, what? Uh, I was, I was shocked. And so I left there. I had to scramble to get, you know, a business actually set up because I was representing myself as having a, you know, consultancy, yeah. which I didn't have at the time. And so I had to like, you know, engineer all this stuff in a very short amount of time to create the Percipio company. Mm. And at the time, I, you know, I think there was one other company I was looking at that had a, a Latin derivative for their name. And I thought it sounded smart. And so I said, Percipio has a lot, the root of the word perception mm. is, Percipio is the Latin, the root of that word. And it means to learn and, uh, you know, to perceive and so that was the birth of the Percipio company. Wow. And then when you, when you did this consult, this initial work, or maybe even later, like when did you decide, where, where did, if you have a brain, you have bias come from, that, that tagline that you often have? So uh, one of the best salespeople I've ever met in my life, he became somewhat of a, um, a, a periodic coach for me. Mm -hmm. And we would get together, you know, every so often, especially when he went off and started doing 
his own thing. Like he wanted to build a better mousetrap for uh, salespeople. And so when he was doing this and I started focusing more and more on my consulting practice, that's when I started pulling together a lot of the framework and the the structure of the engagements that I do now and, and built it around bias, unconscious bias, yeah. how our brains process information and the byproducts that are a, 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 a ingrained part of that really fascinated me. And, uh, and then at the same time, bias started becoming more and more used in a, in, in popular discourse. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there was a very serendipitous moment where I met with this salesperson. I said, Hey, you know, I, I, this is what I do, but I'm not sure I can, you know, lead with that because it has the potential of scaring people off. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I said, you know, maybe I, I need to reframe my business as being more of management consulting. Right. Mm -hmm. And this guy looked at me and he said, why would you want to be one of many? Everybody like, management else. Consultants yeah. are black. Yeah. He said, what you do is so unique, mm -hmm. like stick with that. And uh, I'm so glad I had the, I, I just listened to him and I did. And I trademarked, if you have a brain, you have bias and from bias to belonging. And, and once people understand where that's coming from, then it's, uh, I know it's the right engagement. So it became somewhat of a self, uh, you know, it became a, a filter of sorts, like, you know, if you, if you, if this resonates with you, let's continue the conversation. If it doesn't resonate with you, then I probably wasn't going to do bring very much value to your organization to begin with. Because what you do really does disrupt Matthew when you, when you come, right? It's so much easier for organizations, sadly, to not talk about it, right? To not talk about the bias, to say, we don't see color. We don't see gender. We don't see this. We don't see that. Like, everyone's the same, but we know that's, that's not true. That's not how we're wired. So tell us about your definition of bias. Lead us there. Yeah. Yeah. You just made me think of, uh, you know, one of the epidemics in our modern workplace is a, a generalized pattern of, of conflict aversion. Like people are so, um, this is in general, I'm speaking in very, sure. very general terms, but it's very observable. You can go to any workplace and see it. Yeah. People are very conflict averse mm -hmm. to the point where they just don't, you know, like you end up losing time and money because people are unwilling to just have a candid conversation, right? That has, uh, you know, the they're either afraid that they're going to offend somebody or, right. you know, there's all of these other psychological reasons why they avoid it. And some of them are hidden and some of them are not so hidden, right? Some of them are grounded in their own insecurities and some of them are grounded in fear of other social repercussions or losing face or something like that, right? Yeah. So it's, a, I think one of the beautiful things about bias as a linguistic construct is it's provocative enough to get your attention, mm -hmm. but yet it's not uncommon to say, well, I do have a bias for chocolate instead of ice cream, mm -hmm. right? So it can be used in a positive context. Mm -hmm. So it has all the negative charge to, to get your attention, which you have to have something to capture the attention of people today because right. we're so distracted by devices and by, you know, the, the, the way that that all content is produced, mm -hmm. its origins are to hijack your amygdala in some way, shape or form. Sure. And so if you don't have that as, in terms of like how you're going to be coaching people, for example, mm -hmm. like if you don't figure out how you can hijack their amygdala at some level, right. then you're not gonna, they're gonna, you're gonna be, they're gonna be bored. They're gonna be like, I mean, we're so conditioned to have like these emotionally charged uh, hooks mm -hmm. that when, that hook isn't there, people tend to not pay attention. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about defining bias and what, what's your definition of bias and how you see it show up in the workplace. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's, I described it as a, a useful linguistic construct. Mm 
right? Because at its highest level, bias is a byproduct of how our brains process information. Mm -hmm. So you have cognitive biases, which uh, are things like um, uh, the work of Daniel Kahneman, uh, the sunken cost fallacies, the biases that are, uh, you know, um, that are present in our thinking, right? And are a byproduct of how our brains process information. Those types of biases, I found the five that are most common in every workplace. Like me bias, egocentric bias, availability bias, anchoring bias, and proximity bias. And those five are present in every decision that uh, a person makes in and out of the workplace. But I tend to focus more on how those decisions are made in the workplace. So those types of biases are it's, it's paramount for anybody working in today's era to understand what those five are and how they're impacting their decisions. So help us understand what those five are, um, because I, I know that you have this great assessment tool that people can identify which one might be one of the, those biases that's coming out for them. Everybody has at least one and usually multiple. Um, walk us through each of those. Help us understand, define this. Uh, sure, sure. Happy to do that. Let's see how, how succinctly I can. Um, oh, we have time. Not to worry. That's the beauty of, uh, of our radio show here. We've got plenty <laughs> of time to explain out this stuff. Because, you know, because I, I really want our listeners to understand a different mode of looking at bias, right? We We usually think about bias and we go, oh, it's going to be, you know, like the, the common ones that we hear, right? Like race, gender, age, um, sexual orientation. And it goes so much more deeper than that. There's so much, so many more other biases and, and the ones that show up in the workplace and the ones you can start the conversations on can be very, very aligned yet different. And so I think you do such a remarkable job of helping workplace leaders understand that. And so, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it's useful to put it into this context. Uh, the, the bias ecosystem is, I think, where you can start to properly place these different types of biases. So the five I just described are cognitive biases. And those are five of, of like now well over 200 different named cognitive yeah. biases. There's with advances in neuroscience and in social psychology, evolutionary biology, all of these different uh, interdisciplinary fields of study. We know now so much more about the brain than we did even two years ago, five years right. ago, 10 years ago. And we continue to learn more. So that area of cognitive bias that's where bias is born. Mm. And bias manifests itself into what I collectively call social biases. And that's when you get into identity and race and gender and mm. culture and mm -hmm. age and neuro differentiations and orientation. And all of those types of social biases are more rooted in the social constructs that govern our day to day. Mm -hmm. And those social biases are best measured in behaviors, not necessarily thoughts. Mm. Because the, the, you know, when you're in the realm of cognitive biases and you're talking about how our brains are processing information, there's a lot of uh, useful uh, information you can get from people around you, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you only see what you can see. And so this is where bias creates these different limits to what we can actually uh, engage with and interact with and understand. And so we need each other to fill in those different gaps in our, in their fractures, in our, our ability to think, right? We, not one person can know everything there is to know about anything. We need each other to test each other's thinking, to, you know, proofread something before you send it out, to, you know, bring up to you and with you in a very candid and direct way, how biased your thinking 
may be on a particular topic, mm-hmm. right? And, and you as a recipient of that need to be able to receive it and see it as a gift, right? To see it as something that you're just, you know, it's just uh, recognizing your own limitations, the limitations of your cognitive wherewithal, right? We, we, only we can only process. Bit. Yeah, we can only process so many bits of information at one point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think, and this is why it's really important to make sure we're using language that allows us to have a quality conversation. Mm. And when you start to get into the realm of social biases, there's so much deep history there. There's so much emotion there that it requires a different approach for the conversation. And I think that's when things get really, you know, they can go off the rails really quickly and really yeah. easily if people just jump right in to try to deal with a social bias, any one of them in a transactional manner. Mm-hmm. Like, let me just tell you, like, and, it, it, and there you can hear it. Like, let me just tell you, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's, that's where the, the social biases are almost guaranteed to go off the rails, right? Mm-hmm. It has to be much, much more of a self-reflective process where you're just sharing where you're coming from, right? And that you know needs to be received by the people around you that are engaging in that conversation. And I think when you do that, you're able to really disrupt the bias that's become institutionalized mm. because institutionalized biases are just social biases that have become perpetuated mm-hmm. and not disrupted over time. Mm-hmm. And I think an easy example of that is like somebody who, you know, a, a small company that just goes to the same well to hire Stanford, Berkeley, whatever it might be, MIT, like that's the only place we're going to get our talent. And then they scratch their head going, why are we not getting more talent here? Why aren't we innovating, creating, doing something different? Well, right, right. Yeah. But it's that behavior, right? Over time, that's how that bias becomes institutionalized. Mm. And institutionalized biases are baked into processes protocols, governance of the socially constructed institution. Right. And once that institutional bias exists, that then shapes the cognitive biases of the new people coming into that bias ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So I, I hope that all makes sense. It was a long-winded way of describing how I use bias in different contexts, but it's, it's really a functional model that can help an organization see how bias has become baked into their own, the fabric of their culture. Help us understand some of those examples of cognitive biases that you mentioned before. So starting with like like me bias, describe it, give us an example, and then maybe even a way and you know people can start talking about it. Sure. Uh, like me bias is our, our natural, our very, very natural tendency to gravitate towards people who are like us. Mm-hmm. So like me bias, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's why in a school of, you know, f- of 500 people, even if there's a diverse representation in that school, at lunchtime, all the black kids are sitting together, all the white kids are sitting together, all of the you know, the Asian kids or, or the, you know, all of the Filipino kids or all of the Indian kids or all of the Chinese kids, they're all, we, we gravitate towards that, which is like us because hmm. there's a comfort there, right? There's yeah. a comfort level there. That's, that's, uh, you know, very understandable, very safe. Uh, but yet over time, it can lead to myopic decision-making. It can lead to homogenous work groups. Mm -hmm. And there's ample evidence that shows homogenous work groups underperform diverse work groups, right? We need to have people who are challenging our thinking, who are pointing out our blind spots, who are presenting opposing points of view, who are, uh, you know, who look and, and, and just are different than we are, Mm -hmm. right? Like those types of groups they produce better work, right? So like me bias, it's insidious because it starts out very innocent, but over time can be very destructive to an organization. Yeah, I can see, I can see what you're saying from 
that, especially that myopic thinking and, and in an era where creativity, innovation is so needed, we're, we're constantly evolving. How are we going to do that if we're doing business as usual with people that are having the same sort of thinking, same, same line of thought, and we're not creating this diverse line of thought. What's another cognitive bias and type and example to share? Sure. Uh, the next one in the acronym LEAP, L-E-A-A-P, right? Okay. Like me, egocentric bias. And egocentric bias is, you know, our overvaluing of our own experience. And, uh, and I'm going to share this now with your listening audience. And at the risk of, you know, tainting you to where you're never going to be able to listen to a conversation again the same. Okay. I'm going to do it anyway. That's all right. We, we disrupt a lot of things on the show. So please disrupt How, our conversation, our listening so, conversation. So, so, so the next time you're at a cocktail party or the next time you're at a social <laughs> gathering, a picnic, barbecue, whatever it might be, and, uh, and you start talking about something, right? It could be anything. A natural thing people do is relate it to themselves oh, well, I had that experience or I did this or, yeah. you know, like if you're talking about children, well, my child did this. So it's yeah. it's one of the ways that we just make conversation. We relate to one another, right? Yeah. And I think what happens with egocentric bias is when you're overvaluing that dynamic to the point where you don't, where many people are incapable of seeing other perspectives because they're yeah. so rooted in their own experience mm. that that must be the truth. Mm. And it's, it's in there that egocentric bias is born, mm. right? And, we, and, and in those cases, and often it's an unconscious process. We're not even aware sure. we're doing A lot it. of this is, right? A lot of these cognitive biases are, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. You don't even know that you're yeah. drawn to that person, you know, because they're like you yeah. in the previous example. You don't even know that you're really drawn in this direction and you're thinking because it stems from an, outside of your conscious awareness. Yeah. And so with, with egocentric bias, it's, it's something that over time, you just, uh, you know, you, you become almost oblivious to other perspectives. And over time, you lose the ability to be, you know, to exercise empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, and over time, it's, um, you know, you, you just, you forget that even if you've, even if you've done something for, 20, 30, 40 years or more, you still only know 20, 30, or 40 years of all that there is to know about that one topic, mm. right? So egocentric bias is most, most dominant in doctors. Oh. In wow. lawyers. Yes, yes. In research, okay. in, in engineers, right? People mm. who have deep, deep, deep subject matter expertise yeah. in any one area and have done it for a long period of time, Makes sense. egocentric bias becomes their Achilles heel. Yeah. All right. The A in our LEAP, in your LEAP acronym. Uh, the first A is availability and availability bias. Uh, I think an easy example that is gaining popularity is something called confirmation bias. So that's a derivative of, of, I use availability bias as the biggest umbrella for many types of, of related heuristics and related biases. So when you get into learning about cognitive biases, I mentioned there's over 200, right. many, many, many of them are very, very, very similar. Yeah. And so availability bias at its essence is just making, in, making decisions based on what's quick and easy, mm. what's most right readily Available. available, the yeah. most readily available information. Mm -hmm. And we do it all the time. It's Absolutely. how we make most of the decisions throughout yeah. our day. We use this heuristic called availability heuristic. We just, our brains go for what's easiest. Mm -hmm. Our brains follow the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And then we come to our conclusion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and while that's, you know, we wouldn't be able to function if we didn't have that ability. It also becomes problematic because it creates the conditions for mistakes to be made very easily. And if you're thinking of, you know, in the workplace, 
right? Executives who are making these types of decisions, if they're making these decisions on a whim, their chances of making mistakes are much, 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 much greater mm -hmm. because of availability bias, right? It's, uh, it's something that really requires more discipline. It mm -hmm. requires, uh, you know, effective mitigation techniques for a decision-making process. So you're not just subject to bells and whistles and whims, right? And impulses, yeah. which we all are. Sure. Yeah. But if you put, you know, solid structures around you and people around you and processes around you that will mitigate against mm -hmm. the negative impact of this bias, then that's the a best practice in that case. And again, it's another argument for the need of diversity in your organization, the people around you, because diversity on, on a variety of different levels, not just social, but also like you mentioned, where they went to college or, you know, what, what type of background they might be coming from or, or having that space, that safe space to speak up and speak out about things that challenge maybe what what that executive leader is saying. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you brought up a good point, right? You're referencing these other two biases that we've just discussed and I'm presenting them separately yeah. because they are worthy of exploring as separate phenomena in, sure. our, in our minds, but they're all, they're not mutually exclusive. Like mm -hmm. you can have a single decision and have, 12 different cognitive biases involved in it yeah. all at the wow. same time. Wow. Magic. So it, it really yeah. is, uh, it, it's, it's fascinating and it's, it's fun to try to isolate, right. For yeah. the purpose of any type of academic exercise, right. Like, like science, we love to try to isolate variables so that mm -hmm. we can create test conditions and try to, you know, but, but the whole process of doing that is creating a fictitious world that doesn't exist, right? <laughs> like in the, in the real world, we have all of these competing demands for our attention. We have all of these things happening. And so to think like you could isolate just one, uh, it's, it's ludicrous. But um, anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. Availability yeah. bias, the, the key mitigation strategy is to consider all the information, not mm -hmm. just the information that's readily accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is, anchoring bias. Mm. And this one is, uh, it's really fascinating. On the surface, it's, it's a tendency of our brains to just get anchored on the first data point, the first image mm. uh, of, of any type of conversation. So anchoring bias is the phenomenon that it produces is called priming. So there's lots of research that shows you know, if you give somebody a warm drink as opposed to a cold drink before you ask them to do something, they're actually more likely to do it for you if you if they have a warm beverage in their oh, hand. Fascinating. Beforehand. Okay. Uh, it, it's really fascinating because it's it's this priming phenomenon is all about like what you do before you want to engage with somebody. So in a sales context, salespeople you know are sometimes taught you start here. We're going to call it fifty thousand dollars knowing that we only maybe get in 38,000, but we okay. start up here so that in the mind of the other person, they, they think they're getting a better deal by coming down a little bit. Priming, priming them for that. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what's underneath the priming mechanism is anchoring bias. It's our brains trying to categorize and make sense of whatever's being presented to us. Mm -hmm. And it reaches into our, you know, into our memory and it anchors on that data point or that graph. Mm -hmm. right? And so when you repeat that over and over and over again, which is really the, the basis of the retail industry, right, is to say, here, this is 50% off. And we don't really stop to think like, well, what was the original price and what factors went into naming that price? Like we yeah. just, oh, I'll take two then yeah. because it's 50% off, right? Like, like that's when anchoring bias is serving its purpose in that context. Uh, it gets a little more insidious when you start to think about the powerful imagery mm -hmm. and the role of anchoring bias in a brand, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I often will use, you know, the golden arches of McDonald's, or okay. you could use Victoria's Secret, or you could use Nike. McDonald's but is very internationally known, 
which would appeal to our international audience here. So what about that? Yes. And there's there it's one of the most recognized brands globally, right? Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola, I think, is another one. Right. right? Nike is up there. Like these right. are all globally recognized brands. And part of the reason that they are what they are is because of anchoring bias, because they've been perpetuated so many times, right? Remember, it's over time how the bias ecosystem works. So they yeah. take that image, associate it with positive feelings, with wonderful imagery, with great stories that have absolutely nothing to do with the core product. Right, like like yeah. McDonald's, you know, where their beef is sourced is never included in any of those commercials, right? Yeah. Or 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 if it's beef at all, right? Like McDonald's is brilliant for for catering their actual menu to localized audiences, mm. but what never changes is the reinforcing of this anchored image mm. in the minds of all the consumers, and. It, it, it gets really insidious when you start to look at some of the data around beauty and around like the beauty myth mm -hmm. and how there's these idealized images of women in certain cases, right? It can be traced back to anchoring bias and how this idealized image of what women are supposed to look like in different cultures mm -hmm. becomes anchored like when that plays out over time, what's lost is the damage that it's doing to the 98% of the women who don't fit into that mold, right? But there is born a cosmetic industry, right? <laughs> the billion dollar cosmetic industry to, mm -hmm. to buy this product, to make you look, get closer to that unattainable look, right? Yeah. That's how it, 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 it can be stemmed back to anchoring bias and our brain getting anchored on what this is. This is what is expected. And if I'm not that, then I'm somehow less than. Hmm. And, uh, and I think that's one of the most dangerous of the five biases that, hmm. uh, you know, that's a product and it's being exploited, I think is really what the danger is, is when it's exploited to the degree that it is in our world today, not just in America, but all across the globe. Yeah, and absolutely. that gets the I next gets us to gets us to P. I'm like, wow, we could we could totally go on the anchoring bias even longer. I have like so many questions for you around that, but that will well, have to be the next show when we have to come uh, back. So let's not forget the the mitigation strategy oversimplified yeah. it yeah. is, but consider the source. Yeah, like what is the credibility of that anchor? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's identifying the anchor first of all, but then consider the source of where that's coming from. Right. And whether it be retail, like how did they land on that price at, as being a, you know, the, the manufacturer suggested retail price for a car? Well, pff, OK, they get to make it up. They're the manufacturer. Right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, proximity bias is the last of the five that are that I found these five of the 200 or more cognitive biases. These five are the most common. Mm -hmm. And the last one is proximity bias. And proximity bias is our tendency to overvalue that which is closest to us by mm -hmm. time and space. And in a pre-COVID world, proximity bias was already very pernicious. It was already very widespread. Mm -hmm. But what COVID did was really get us thinking differently about yeah. proximity bias. Right. And, uh, and if anything, it disrupted the existing norms that we had around proximity mm -hmm. and taught us some new ways to engage with one another that have removed time and distance, right? right. Like, like how we're doing this, carrying on right. this conversation right now. Absolutely. You're in Northern California. I'm in Southern California. It's incredible. Like, would we have done this even five years ago, even though we had Zoom capability to do that, but would we have done it? Probably not. I'd be interviewing people right next to me near me. Correct. I could right, physically right, go right, 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 right. Yeah. Yes. So the, the mitigation strategy is what we've been doing, which is removing time and space from the equation. Mm -hmm. So you and I can have this conversation and it can be as if we were right across the table from one another. Yeah. Wow, Matthew, we are like just jamming. There is so much here in the world of bias, especially, um, 
you know, working with leaders and thinking about it from the unconscious bias perspective to start the conversations, it's not as, uh, I think it's it's less challenging, it's more open when when we do it in the context, the construct of the way you've you've described it and looked at it. Take us um, from from bias to belonging, this other tagline of yours in in the last like few minutes that we have here. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, your listeners on the Percipio Company homepage, uh, and I hope there'll be a URL somewhere for wherever yep, they there will. This, uh, they can take the bias assessment. It's a, a very simple introduction to these five different areas that we've broken down thus far. There's also a belonging assessment. I found these questions are both the best way to start conversations, but also to start your own learning journey, right? When you are, when you, when you learn to, to ask really good questions, you can get a lot more out of a person, place, or thing than you can if you just try to like provide all of the answers. If that mm-hmm. makes any sense. Yeah. Really yeah. good questions. The I think foundation are, of coaching. Of course, that makes sense. <laughs> absolutely. I'm preaching to the choir. Preaching to the choir. Um, but the belonging assessment is, you know, another set of statements that are asking you to be self-reflective. And they're focused in to build off of that work, you know, that people have done already to deepen their understanding of their own biases. And when you do that, you start to discover new parts of yourself right? Your own identity. And that's the first cornerstone of belonging. So belonging is, uh, you know, it's a relatively new uh, letter to the, to the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Belonging. But what I'm attempting to do is to pause and really define what that means Mm -hmm. and not just have it be a misunderstood or misdefined word from the onset. So identity is really inclusive of all dimensions of diversity. Agency is the second cornerstone of belonging. And agency opens up conversations about who you are in your respective work culture. What role do you have? What responsibilities do you have? How do they how do those align with your skill sets? Agency is not just your comfort ability it's it, in, in, in terms of like psychological safety in the workplace, but also your confidence. Like how can yeah. you hold the space that needs to be held to have conversations about conflict or problems, yeah. right? Agency is a person's ability to live into the role and the responsibilities that they've been given by that employer or that organization. I love that and have the confidence to get into those roles. And be yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's space. agency is where we would unpack and uncover the imposter monsters. Right? <laughs> that's, uh, that's that's where it's at. I yeah, mean, that's yeah. somebody bringing their identity and then aligning mm-hmm. it with the role so that they can really fulfill whatever it is that they're looking to fulfill their purpose. Their you know the, why they're the bigger why as to what they you know why they're doing what they're doing, and then power is the third cornerstone of belonging. And power, I intentionally named it that way because power is something that people run from in many cases, and they are gravitated and pulled towards it, perhaps when they're not even aware of it. There's power dynamics in everything. Mm-hmm. There's power dynamics in our conversation the moment we started it, right? Like yeah. this is your show, Ashi, right? But in order for you to be effective, you have to give that power away to let your guest yeah. share whatever it is that they're going to share. Absolutely. And yeah. then it's it's reciprocated. And what yeah. people, the problem that people get into with power is that they they feel like they own it. Mm. And that's really just a, another mental construct that's reinforced in many cases by social constructs, but it's it's an illusion, right? And uh, and so I think power is something that it's uh, it's worthy of exploring in every context. And what comes out of this with my clients that are bold enough to tackle it head on is that people come away more empowered, yeah, and feeling like they have 
greater sense of agency yeah. because they know how to navigate through and work better, more collaboratively. There's mm -hmm. more innovation, right? It's yeah. really amazing when you increase the transparency around power, how much greater productivity becomes. And this is this is the work that you do, you going into companies and helping them understand how to go from bias to belonging. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Feels that empowerment, like you said, um, empowerment agency that that they're a part of a, a place that where they they do belong. They really have that sense and they really feel that they're really integrated into that into that environment and they're going to really have those those success stories wow matthew there's so much to unpack here this is like incredible i, I feel like we just got this huge educational le lesson in the world of bias and I, I i it's it's so powerful and i love what you do and what you've done even beyond your company you've also created this huge community of people in this weekly series that you have. Tell us about inclusive leadership in a virtual world in, in about a, a minute or so. Well, I, I can tie it all together with the common, with the fourth cornerstone of belonging, which okay. is flow, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. Asha, you you and I have just had a flow state for the last 50 minutes. Now yep, we're out it of went time. so fast. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that's that's a characteristic of a flow yeah. state. Uh, and with the inclusive leadership in a virtual world, that 60 minute meeting every Wednesday at 10 o'clock Pacific is designed to right after this, right? State. You're going to go straight from us to that. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's designed to create a flow state for everybody that comes in. And you can do that uh, when you change your thinking about how you design virtual engagements. And mm -hmm. so that's what we do each Wednesday. It's amazing. Uh, it, it, is, it, it, it has created a sense of belonging for the people that are coming week in and week out. So uh, you know, you've been Absolutely, with the group. Yeah. It's the most illuminating hour of the week. It goes by like that because we're, we're mixing the ingredients to create. It's a, it's a formula for flow. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yes. Highly encourage. And anyone will, will have the, the links in the social media handles. Um, but yeah, anyone can join it. And at any time you, you just, you drop in, there's always a great speaker there. Matthew, you lead a really great series there. Matthew, there's so much here. This has been amazing. Um, how do we get in touch with you if someone wants to connect to hear more, talk to you more about what you do and what your company does? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way to find me. My website uh, is the is percipiocompany.com, P-E-R-C-I-P-I-O company.com. And there you can find the bias assessment, the belonging assessment, a link to register for inclusive leadership in a virtual world. Uh, it's a wealth of information. There's other tools that are there that you can use that will uh, help you with whatever type of initiative you're looking to do in your organization. There's resources, there's videos, there's uh, interactive cards. Remember the, the inclusivity cards yeah, that we would give yeah. out at the end of the workshops? Those are, those are all accessible from percipiocompany.com. And so for those listening who may not know where to start with some of these conversations or now have a different construct with which in which to have these conversations, I highly recommend you look at these tools that Matthew and his team have put out and together, it's really going to help you to get those conversations started and going. And especially that weekly series you have, like there's so much learning there as well. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much. So grateful for you being here and on our show. Uh, this is Ashi Aurora, iRise Executive Coaching, Leaders Creating a Ruckus, signing off on ruckusavenueradio.com. Thank you.